Hello, hello, and welcome to another episode of My First Dollar. I am Taryn Arnold with Buy Me A Coffee, and this week I have just the absolute pleasure uh, to be joined by, I'm very excited to say all this, to be joined by one of Scotland's most exciting fiddle players, composers, teachers, now podcaster, the 2017 Composer of the Year, Adam Sutherland. Ah. Is that how you say your last name or is it, does it just sound a lot better when you say it? Uh, it is Sutherland and uh, oh. it's actually, it comes from the old uh, Viking uh, word Suderland, which is like, means Southern land because they came and visited us, uh, to put it mildly, <laughs> and we were south of them. So, yeah. <laughs> Classic. Uh, where in the world are you? I know you and I, I chatted s- before, but. Yeah, I'm sitting in Glasgow, and uh, it's dark and and rainy and wet and windy, which it is standard here <laughs> yeah, in Scotland. Do you enjoy that weather, or are you bummed about it? I don't mind it because I have one of these sad lights, which you might see kind of affecting the room here. I do. It looks a bit kind of pretty lit. But uh, yeah, I'm absolutely zinging on my sad light. I sit in front of it all day, every day. Normally I get a little bit like, oh my God, it's so dark. But now I'm just like very happy. <laughs> you just got those. You got those everywhere. I got to get me one of those. Works. Well, cheers. Thanks for joining. What are you uh, What are you sipping on? Oh, I'm living life right on the edge here. This is actually a, a hot water. Wow, you're wild. I know. And this is uh, Fort Augustus. <laughs> which is ah. uh, a wee village at the southwest end of Loch Ness. And I'm from the south side of Loch Ness myself, so just a wee bit at home. I, I was dying to ask you, I mean, Loch Ness, how does it feel to be from Loch Ness? I'm sure this you get this often, but, you know, you're for what I imagine is a pretty small place, I don't know, but it has a very recognizable name. We all know what the Loch Ness Monster is. What... What do you have to say on behalf of your folks of Loch Ness? <laughs> you know, it, it is quite amazing that like people everywhere in the world, people know about Loch Ness, which is quite amazing. And you know, <laughs> uh, I'm for, I was brought up at the end of a track in the absolute country bumpkin kind of lifestyle. My parents bought an old croft. A croft is like a small farm, Gaelic word. Hmm. And they, they went to live this dream in the 70s of growing their own vegetables and all that. And uh, they brought up some feral children, myself being one of those. And uh, uh, yeah, it's amazing that people know where it, they know about it. And they, yeah. know that they, they know that, you know, that Nessie is real. Oh, wow. You say that with conviction. And I love that for us. <laughs> she is. She's is very real. Um, so tell me, you told me a little bit about, you know, how you were brought up. Tell me how you got into music and how that kind of connected to your childhood or when that all started happening for you. It's quite a, a not your, it's quite a strange start for me. Like, uh, I didn't come from a musical family. I just, uh, my dad used to love running races. Uh, mm-hmm. He ran marathon races all the time and he started getting a sore knee, you know, a really common complaint. I'm sure many of your listeners and viewers will know how a sore knee from running so he went to the doctor uh, in the small village of Foyers which is just <laughs> on the shores of Loch Ness it's very beautiful he went there and the doctor said uh, I think you might have to just stop running oh, um, no. so or stop running so much so my dad was kind of you know looking a little bit crestfallen you know, being Scottish, she nearly showed some emotion. Yep. Uh, <laughs> and uh, the doctor sensed this, I think, and he went into his back room where all his pills and potions are stored and he came out with a fiddle case and a phone what? number and said, try this. So he like said, you know, you have to find something else to do with your life. So uh, he prescribed <laughs> my father the fiddle. And so dad came home from the doctor and we were like, how did you get on and what's in that case? And he's like, well, it's, it's a fiddle. Uh, so yeah, he gave, the doctor gave my dad this phone number of a, an old man who lived on the other side of Loch Ness, a guy called Donald Riddle. And I only just realised <laughs> recently that that rhymes with fiddle. I don't know if yeah. I noticed that growing up. 
<laughs> Donald Riddle taught me and my dad to fiddle. Hey diddle. Anyway, um, <laughs> so like, uh, I started going for fiddle lessons on the other side of Loch Ness every Saturday morning. We drove over there and we had this kind of car. I don't know if you ever had that. these kind of cars over in the US. They're, they're Russian, they're Lada. Did you guys ever have Lada cars? Oh, no, I've, I've never heard of it, but I'm sure people have. They're, they kind of made their way uh, into the UK. They're about as unaerodynamic a vehicle as you can imagine. It's basically <laughs> just this kind of square with wheels. So we drove around Loch Ness in this cube uh, uh, to get fiddle lessons. And that's how I got started. That seems like such a random thing for this doctor to be like, you know what? You're a big runner. You're a big athlete. Here's a fiddle. D- do you feel like it was, I don't know, fate? Because it's like such a niche thing. It's not even like a guitar or piano where, you know, most people play it. I don't know. I mean, it's not your average prescription. Uh, <laughs> Do- Dr. Bennett was his name. You know, he, he played the fiddle a bit as well. Um, but I just think now and again, I have no idea what I would be doing with my life without the fiddle. So a seemingly insignificant small decision from a doctor to a middle-aged man with a sore knee, like set off a, my entire life. I just have no idea what I'd be doing there because I fell, fell in love with it and uh, and eventually started getting paid to play it, which I couldn't quite believe the first time that happened. It was like, you're going to give me money to play the fiddle. <laughs> uh, and then everyone else in high school was like doing these career choices and filling in this form on an early Macintosh computer to find out what job you would do. And I was just like, I have no idea what I want to do. And then someone said... <laughs> Do you want to play the fiddle? You and your whistle playing mate, come and play music in our restaurant on a Wednesday night for 20 quid. So it was like, yeah, Whoa. okay. And then I thought, right, I'm going to just keep doing this as long as I can get away with it. I'm sure, I'm sure I'll have to get a real job someday. That might happen still, but uh, yeah, I've been getting away <laughs> with it. I'm 41, I've been getting away with it ever since. Running around with a fiddle, just like it's a secret. That's amazing. Um, when did you know it could be something? Like, when were you like, okay, this isn't just me playing a fiddle for fun. This is actually where my life is going to go. Or did you kind of always know that? Well, I um, I started going to fiddle schools on the Isle of Skye, which is like really popular destination for tourists hmm. in Scotland. It's beautiful. Um, I think some of, some of Outlander was filmed in oh, cool. Skye. I actually ended up being an extra in an episode of Outlander. Oh my gosh, I got to add actor to your <laughs> your list. I was, a, I was like a featured extra. I didn't even know that was a big deal. I met I met a lady in an airport in Halifax Airport in Canada in 2014 and she was like, "Oh, you she was an American lady. I won't try and do your accent, but she said, "Oh, you've got you've got a violin." And I said, "Oh, it's, it's a fiddle actually." And she was like, "Oh, we love Outlander." And I was like, "Oh, have you heard of that show?" Cuz I just did an extra in that, and I think she like spluttered on her coffee, because uh, I remember noticing there was little bits of... Anyway, um, that's when I first realised that Outlander was quite a big deal. I had no idea. Yeah. Anyway, sorry, I just totally tangented off away there. Um, You're fine. I went to Isle of Sky, and this amazing fiddle teacher called Alistair Fraser, who actually lives in California now, mm. he's like this Scottish fiddle guru. He's just the most amazing teacher. Mm. And he gave us all, us students, a love for the old tunes because it's like a several hundred year old tradition of, it's not called an oral tradition of tunes and songs. Mm. And he gave us this deep respect and love for these tunes. But he also gave us a, a sense that we were also entitled to make the music our own. So it's mm. like one one foot kind of in the past and one foot stepping forward. So... He was really interested in what I was doing. I remember one day he was just like, what's that you're doing? And I was just mucking around. Or as we say in Glasgow, fanning about. I was just fanning <laughs> about. And he, um, he was like, oh, that's really interesting. And I remember thinking, is it? <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, and then but he just, he gave me this, he gave all the students a, a really like a beautiful thing, which was like a belief that you could make music your own. Mm. And that you sh- you should in a way and try and find your own way of playing music. So mm. I got 
kind of hooked on, I came from his courses and he was so inspiring. And my first fiddle teacher had passed away and I came back home and I was like, oh my God, I really want to get better at the fiddle. And then I started like trying to teach myself that one day because he, Alistair almost said, question everything, ask questions. So I was like, I'm going to question stuff. So <laughs> You're like, he said it, I'm going to do it. Here I go. I'm going to do it. So I started questioning my own beliefs and I was like, oh, I want to get better at the fiddle. Oh, well, you can't get better at the fiddle because you don't have a teacher. What? What? Well, can't I, can I get better without a teacher? No, you need a teacher. This is my inner monologue, by the way. You know how I'm talking about Yeah. So I was like, <laughs> why, why do you think you need to have a teacher to get better with a fiddle? You just, you just do. But why? Because that's the only way you learn stuff. Because you learn stuff when people, teachers show you. You, you, you don't just work it out yourself. <laughs> why, why do I think that? I don't know. So anyway, eventually I started trying to see if I could get a bit better at the fiddle on mm. my own and yeah. I thought well what I hit, I hit play on my CD player and Alistair Fraser was like beautiful big sound and I was just like why can't I do that why can't I play like him he's got arms I've got arms he's got fingers I've got fingers <laughs> what is he doing why can't I do that what and I thought well it just sounds really nice what is he doing that I'm not doing he just sounds amazing so I thought maybe I could just try and sound amazing and then I felt immediately naive for thinking that it was going to be that easy <laughs> I'm just going to sound amazing at the fiddle right now. And then I started playing and I just tried to make the nicest sound I could. And then what happened was I didn't immediately sound like Alistair Fraser, but I did sound ever so slightly better Mm. than than myself. And then I got a real rush of excitement because I realised that I'd just challenged some belief that I need. I'd overturned some belief that I had that you have to wait to be shown stuff. And then I was like, I'm going to see what else I can work out. So I started teaching myself how to play the fiddle. And I'm still doing that. I love teaching as a result of that. Uh, So that's when I got hooked. The long answer. Sorry to your question. No, my gosh. I was like entranced. It reminded me of this book that I read about tennis. and, And he was talking about, he was like this long coach. Or he's been a coach his whole life. And he was talking about how you shouldn't, when you're coaching someone to play tennis, don't sit there and say, no, swing this way or focus on this or that, or don't get so technical about it. Ask them to hit the ball in the corner. Tell them to do whatever you need to do to get to the ball in the corner. And then people start focusing less on every little tweak that they're making and more on what they do to get the end result. And it just reminded me of your story where it's just like, how do I sound a little bit better? And it just kind of worked. (laughs) It just kind of happens that way. That's exactly it, because like, I had a, a, a violin teacher was trying to get me to hold it this way and move my elbow a bit, and I just was... He never actually asked me to try and just make a particular type of sound. Yeah. And then what I noticed was that when I just started trying to make a particular type of sound, a nice sound, that I noticed that my arms started doing the things that they'd been trying to show me. Mm. And I was like, oh, why didn't you just... So, yeah, it's a similar thing to the tennis. It's just try and get a result. And yeah. However you, however you get there, you can debate that, but as long as you kind of get there. Without, without That's even. awesome. And how did you gain a following doing what you do? Like, how are people finding you playing the fiddle? Um, well, I've been working at it for ages. My, I just... Uh, I, I started writing tunes, pieces of music, when I was a teenager. Yeah. And I just found... Uh, I found some notes that I particularly liked one day and uh, I just got really excited. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, this is fun. <laughs> I, could, I, I could play it if you like. I've got my fiddle right here. Please do. I, oh my gosh, I was going to ask, but I didn't want to impose. <gasps> I just, fun. the first, first time I wrote a tune, I found these notes. And I was like, oh. oh, that's fun. I quite like that. <laughs> so maybe, is that allowed? Is that a bit bluesy? I'm not sure if I'm allowed to do that. Oh my gosh. Really exci- <laughs> I just got really excited. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. And then I started writing some tunes. And then occasionally I'm just like stumbling. I was trying to practice the fiddle, trying to get better. And then I would kind of find some notes and just stumble across something that I would like. Go, ooh, like that. <laughs> and then, so I started writing tunes. And then I went to university, which I never finished, but I went to university. Um, 
when I was at, just at 18 and I met a bunch of guys and we started a band. Oh, cool. And it was like just the most fun thing to do. Then we all <laughs> dropped out of university at the same time, much to our parents' horror. <laughs> of course. Doing what? But actually they were all really supportive of us. So then we went to a kind of stage of penury and poverty and... <laughs> But, all that like making age 18 19 20 discovering we we're all writing our own music and discovering our own music the band was called croft number no. five cool and like just writing stuff and finding out exploring so we started a band and we got we got on the radio and we and we got oh, some gigs, and gigs and all right start started from there and I just keep writing and keep playing and and uh yeah, so, and then, then weirdly, people started playing one of the tunes I'd written. Mm. We were going to the, the pub one night, this pub in Glasgow called the Ben Nevis Bar, and they were all playing this tune that I'd written, and I remember I'm just getting full of adrenaline and, like, sweaty palms and just going, they're playing my tune. That's really, really weird. I didn't ask them to do that. No one's asking them. They just seem to be wow doing that. Uh, and then that, that, that one tune just kind of, Got a bit, got a bit out of control, and uh, it's just real that I wrote when I was nineteen, and then it, it's, uh, and now it's like, it's been recorded like fifty times, and it's been, Dang. it's played in YouTube videos all over the world and stuff, and uh, it's not, it's not even my tune anymore, so it feels like, it's like it's just gone off. A lot of people think it's Irish, uh, which I quite like. <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't care that no one knows really that I wrote it. It's just like, so I don't know. It's just I just start and I, I teach tune writing now, and I just I don't know. I'm just kind of feeling the way. Uh, That's so yeah. You seem very go with the flow about all of it. Like it just seems like it's taken you on a journey, which is really cool. It's actually that's a good way of putting it. Like when you're writing a tune, it's it's almost like the tune is not you. It's like where does the tune want to go? And you have to let the tune take you. You're quite right, mm. actually. Rather than you directing it, it's almost like you have to kind of submit to where it wants to go and give it its own life, which is definitely something I quite like to do, just submit. I was, when you played your that little tune earlier, I was thinking about how in my head, the fiddle is only for like happy music. Like it's only for like, doo, 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 like this kind of vibe. <laughs> Are you... Are you a pretty happy person? Like, do you have to be a happy guy to be playing the fiddle? Or do you, does it kind of trick you into being happy? I don't know. I guess what I'm saying is when I listen to music like that, it's like, bam, I'm in a good mood. I'm feeling playful. How does that work with like your life and going through tough times and good times and playing a little instrument that sounds so fun? It's been my therapy. Mm. Like totally. Like uh, the first time it, I came to therapy, I came home from the school and I was like not in a good frame of mind and just belted out some noise on the fiddle. It's a type of tune we have called a Strath Spade. It's quite mm-hmm. angry. That's really satisfying if you're having a bad day. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> So uh, I, I just noticed, oh thank you, I was just making it up there, but like, it's like therapy, I just play the fiddle and just let out, try to like allow a bridge between how you're feeling and the sound. Yeah. So eventually, if, if you get it open, an open channel and the sound you're making is how you're feeling, it's almost like finding a knot in a muscle if you're doing a massage, it's like, oh yeah, that sound, that's the sound, oh yeah, it feels better. And then eventually, <laughs> eventually you're like, all the overwhelming emotion is gone and you're left totally. with a piece of music. So some pieces of music are happy, others are like really not happy. Yeah. Uh, but it's like, it's been my every single emotion. I get over, I get emotional overloads all the time. Yeah. And then, and then the music is like a healthy way to let that out. That's um, so cool. I found out just like two years ago, thanks to my wife, that she responsible for me eventually getting diagnosed with having ADHD mm. um, and I've been like what that's a thing and then reading all about it and going oh. and one of the signs <laughs> of it is like uh, one of the signs of it in case you don't know is like emotional 
kind of dysregulation. So you get like mm. huge, hugely upset about things or really, really happy about things. And, uh, <laughs> so like playing the fiddle and writing music has been the perfect little kind of way of s- stabilizing all the intense emotions. That's so and, cool. Uh, I just, it's been great. It's been, I don't know what I'd do without it, you know? Yeah. What's something that you wish you would have known at the beginning of your fiddling journey? Um, maybe, maybe more on the side of turning it into a career and how this has been a lifelong thing for you. What's something you would have liked to know back then? Oh, I would say have a little bit more faith in yourself. Don't be quite, uh, don't believe, don't believe what all those people have said. Just, uh, you're okay. Yeah. Oh, I like that. Um, how do you, a few more questions. How, like in my head, and I could be totally wrong, but the fiddle seems like a very like steadfast, uh, like a, like a traditional kind of, you know, thing. And how do you marry that with like the internet? Because I know you have a podcast. I know that you teach on YouTube. You do all that kind of stuff. I don't know. Just talk to me about taking something that's kind of like old and sacred and tying it into technology today. Well, it's a fun thing, the internet, for sharing music with people. And I think that the buy me a coffee thing is, I really like it because yeah. I, uh, even before the whole COVID thing, I was kind of putting up videos of me just playing new tunes I'd written or whatever. But, uh, I, but buy me a coffee thing is a great way just for people to chuck in a penny. I, I call it kind of like busking. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's optional. And you're yeah. not like demanding that people chuck in any money. And if they do or not, it's up to them. But um, what I've been liking this year is just been going to some different places. I suppose you'd call it creating content and just taking the fiddle to some like intense places and playing. Uh, and then allowing the internet to do its thing and Mm -hmm. so like in in the spring there's this lovely river in Glasgow called the River Kelvin and I I walk up there most days because the the city kind of disappears and you go up there but there's this beautiful bridge with this uh, arc uh, curve and it's like really stony and echoey and I always try to sing in there when I got there but I feel really self-conscious so I have to wait till folk like aren't there I get really annoyed mm-hmm. when they do turn up, but I mean, they're allowed to turn up. I suppose it's public, but, <laughs> but I'm going to go in there. I want to go in there in the early morning when the sun is up and do some recordings. So I had to kind of break in there in May. I had to climb over a, a gate and a fence mm. uh, at like half five in the morning. <laughs> and the, the sun was up and the birds were tweeting. And then I just set up the wee phone camera at one end of this tunnel. And I went to the other end so that the microphone was getting all of the reverb mm. and uh, and then I just played whatever the hell came into my head and made some stuff up but I did it live and uh, and I think we got like it got shared like 65 times or something like that and uh, awesome and that was the I suppose it, it was part of, mostly an artistic thing just to want to do it but also just it was really handy to help pay my rent that month yeah. re- really did help when there was no other gigs and I was just kind of left feeling, whoa, I just kind of feel like I did a gig. Mm-hmm. Walking home at quarter to seven in the morning, feeling like I did a gig. Um, so mm-hmm. there's lots of different ways people are getting their music out there Yeah. Uh, on the internet, but certainly things like this are great. That's really cool. Um, why do you think that people buy you a coffee? Well, they, they, they leave me nice wee comments. Uh, I think they just like, people like novelty, I think. I'm noticing mm. that. Because I went back to Under the Bridge another time and there was like less of a good response. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to get upset by that. Like, oh, you don't like this anymore. <laughs> but I'm just noticing, you don't like me anymore. But uh, I'm just noticing people like, people like new stuff. So they liked it again. I went to the shores of Loch Ness a bit later in the summer and I bought a battery powered amp and I got some effects. Mm. and uh and uh yeah they like that again so i think they like <laughs> novelty i think i hope they i think people like a a bit of effort yeah as well i think people like it if you feel like you've dug deep but as also as always people really like it if you 
if you get to them musically, if you make yeah. them feel, it sounds really cheesy, but if you make them feel something, then not that's... cheesy at all. I like already can't wait for you to play another little ditty. I'm all excited about it. Um, <laughs> maybe we'll have you play us out, but maybe one last question for you. What, um, what are you working on now or what are you excited about that people can kind of tune in for if they're curious? Okay. Um, since the start of lockdown, I'm trying to up my game as a composer and mm. rather than just write a single melody with some chords of a, a student of mine, a lovely lady called Fatma has uh, mm. sadly been battling cancer mm. and at the start of lockdown when everyone was doing these uh, fundraising videos for the National Health Service, I thought maybe we could do a wee fundraising video. So I asked mm. Fatma because she used to be a nurse and I said to her, do you want to how about this? How about I write a tune and we do something good and mm. uh, raise some money? So she chose this cancer charity called the Beatson Cancer mm. Charity based in Glasgow because they're awesome. And she used to be a, a palliative nurse herself and she had lots of experience with that. And so I started writing this piece for double bass and cello and fiddles and violas and drum kit and harp and piano and trombone and trumpet and saxophone <laughs> and guitar and another guitar and a mandolin and percussion. <laughs> just, a, just a couple things. I know, it just grew arms and legs. And, uh, <laughs> so I started like having to buy all this software which I didn't know how to use. It was kind of like signing up for a marathon when you have never walked a mile. <laughs> and uh, I was just like, oh my God. Anyway, it's almost finished. We're, we're going to be launching on the 17th of December mm. uh, on Radio Scotland on a show called Travelling Folk and it's going to feature 28 different musicians oh, wow. recorded and we're going to try and raise £5,000 for the Beats and Cancer charity That's and so, so there's cool. going to be a video with us all playing and this piece of music that's taken me seven months to write that lasts wow. five and a half minutes long um, so I'm really excited to do something hopefully good for the world. Uh, that is so raise, cool. Raise some money. And uh, yeah, quite excited about that. Dang. Most people are like, yeah, you know, I'm just making music or I'm just watch making a video. You're like, okay, I've got 40 instruments, 28 <laughs> people. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, hey, Adam, one more cheers. And then would you mind playing us a little ditty while we say goodbye? Oh. Absolutely. Okay. I'll play a tune I wrote in high school. It's called Trip to the Market. <laughs> That was actually perfect because I am taking a trip to the market right now. So that will be playing in my head as I do it. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much. Lovely to chat with you. And you, Tyron. Nice to meet you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, nice on. to meet you. <laughs>